In this video, I'm going to address a very specific question that might seem like a bit of a silly question at first, but I do have an end in mind. We're going to work through some of the calculations, then I'll briefly address how it relates to a discussion of reproducibility in scientific studies. My wording on this first slide is a little loose, and the question is not answerable as stated, but I will shore up some of the details a little later. This slide is just to show the gist of the question I address here. If two samples of size n are about to be drawn from the same population, what is the probability that the sample mean from sample number 2 falls within the 95% confidence interval for the population mean that we calculate from the data in sample 1? In more casual terms, if we were to use one confidence interval as a prediction interval for the other sample mean, how would we fare? This was inspired by this poor interpretation of a confidence interval that I heard many years ago on a video and I've heard related misconceptions more than a few times since. The person calculated a confidence interval, and then in an effort to explain what it meant, said that if you repeat the same study a million times, then the sample means should fall within that first interval 95% of the time. This is bad on a number of fronts, a main one being that our interpretation of confidence intervals always relate to parameters and never statistics. But it's also simply untrue. We wouldn't expect 95% of the sample means in repeated sampling to fall within one randomly selected interval. But what is the correct probability? We're going to find out here. Keep in mind that the probabilities I speak of are calculated before we collect the samples. If we are staring at an existing interval, the value of mu is still unknown, and we simply do not know the probability that the sample mean of another sample will fall in that specific interval. Recall the basic notion that mu represents the population mean, a parameter. Its value is unknown, and we're trying to estimate it. We draw a sample from the population, calculate the sample mean, and a corresponding confidence interval for mu. Let's say we're calculating 95% confidence intervals. Our first interval might look something like this, where the larger central dot represents the sample mean, and the dots on the endpoints are, well, the endpoints of the 95% interval. Here, this first interval managed to capture the true value of mu, although in practice we're not going to know that. If we repeatedly sampled from the population, some intervals would contain mu, some not. Let's do that. This second one captures mu, as does the third, but then this fourth one misses. If we repeatedly sampled off to infinity, 95% of these 95% confidence intervals would capture the true value of mu. But what about the sample means? On average, what proportion of the sample means would a randomly selected interval capture? Well, that's not a trivial question, and truth be told, when I first calculated this a few years ago, the answer surprised me a little. Just a bit. Let's take a look at the calculations. Here are the details of the question. Suppose that we are about to draw a simple random sample of n observations from a normally distributed population, then calculate a 95% confidence interval from mu. We're going to suppose at first that sigma is known, so we will calculate the endpoints of the interval using the formula x bar plus and minus z sub alpha over 2 times sigma over the square root of n. We could do these calculations when sigma is unknown, using t rather than z, but it's a bit more complicated, and I'm using z as it gets us to essentially the same conclusion a little more simply. Recall that the appropriate z value for a 95% interval is 1.96. I'll talk about t after. The question is, if we were to draw another independent sample of the same size from this population, what is the probability that the sample mean of this second sample falls within the 95% confidence interval from mu that we will find in the first sample? Hmm, what do you think? 95%? 90%? We can't tell because it depends on n or sigma? Let's find out. Let x bar 1 be a random variable representing the mean of sample 1, and x bar 2 be a random variable representing the mean of sample 2 and let mu and sigma represent the mean and standard deviation of the population, as per usual. The endpoints of the 95% confidence interval for mu are given by this formula. We want to find the probability the mean of sample 2 falls between the lower and upper bounds of that interval, so we want to find this. In these types of calculations, it's often helpful to bring our random variables together 
so I'm going to subtract x bar 1 everywhere. Here, the difference in sample means is the only random variable, and everything else is a constant. So we need to know the distribution of the difference in sample means in order to take a shot at figuring out this probability. I discussed the details of the sampling distribution of the difference in sample means in great detail in other videos. But here, it's sufficient for us to know that under the conditions described above, x bar 2 minus x bar 1 is normally distributed with a mean that is equal to the difference in population means, but since we're sampling from the same population here, the difference in population means is zero. And the standard deviation is the square root of the variance, the variance being the sum of the individual variances of the sampling distributions of the sample means. Simplifying a bit, we get a standard deviation of root 2 times sigma over root n. Now we're simply going to standardize in the usual way, by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. This quantity has the standard normal distribution. After subtracting 0 and dividing by root 2 sigma over the square root of n, we end up with this, where z is a standard normal random variable. And now we can note that sigma cancels out, as does the square root of n, and we're left with this expression, which doesn't involve the population standard deviation or the sample size. And if we go to software to find that area, we find that it's approximately 0.835. Now that might seem a little low. When we're about to draw two samples from the same population, the probability the sample mean of one is captured in the 95% confidence interval for mu of the other is only about 83%. An implication of this is that on average a randomly selected 95% confidence interval for mu would only capture about 83.5% of the sample means in repeated sampling from the population. What if sigma is not known, and we're estimating the standard deviation from sample data and using t, as is typically the case? The situation doesn't change much. It's a little tougher to explain, but the calculation turns out to be fairly simple. I'm going to jump straight to the results. This plot illustrates the probability if we use the t procedure. For small sample sizes, the probability is quite a bit bigger than the 0.835 that we calculated above, but it quickly approaches it as the sample size increases. Here I'll put in a green line to represent the value of 0.835 that we found above. For reasonably large sample sizes, the probability is very close to 0.835. Who cares? Well, I do for one, and this is my channel. I decided to find that probability mainly out of curiosity, because the question arises in some bad confidence interval interpretations. But perhaps more importantly, this has applications in reproducibility studies, sometimes called replicability studies. You might have heard in the news of the so-called crisis of reproducibility. In one study published in Science Magazine, a large team of researchers tried to replicate 100 old psychology studies and found that the new results differed from the original results a large proportion of the time. Now keep in mind that the real reason we care about similar studies having similar results is that they both tell us something about the underlying reality. They are both based on some underlying reality. And if they're both adequately reflective of the underlying reality, then they should tend to have similar results. What we are really looking for is studies that effectively inform us about the underlying reality. But since we can't possibly compare the results of a given study with that unknown underlying reality, Comparing it to other studies does help in the search for the truth. Here are a couple of lines from the abstract of that reproducibility paper I briefly discussed above, where they replicated 100 psychology studies and compared the results. This article resulted in a great deal of discussion and received a lot of attention in the media. 47% of original effect sizes were in the 95% confidence interval of the replication effect size the effect size found in the replication study. Those numbers might seem a little low. One could be forgiven for reading that and thinking that the 47% should be approximately 95% if all were on the up and up, but that's simply not the case. There are all sorts of possible reasons for why that 47% might be so low, with factors such as publication bias, slightly different experimental designs or sampling from slightly different populations, or the cherry-picking of results,
or other even more troubling possibilities, such as the fabrication of data and other shenanigans that, unfortunately, sometimes happen. I'm not implying anything about these particular studies, just that it happens. But even if everything were on the up and up, with all assumptions perfectly justified and no bias whatsoever, we still wouldn't expect to see 95% of the original effect sizes in the 95% confidence intervals for the effects found in the replication studies. It would be much lower. It wouldn't be exactly the 83.5% we found here, as different statistical methods were used and there are other complicating factors. The authors of the study claimed that the expected percentage is about 78.5%, a little different from our 83.5, but in the ballpark. As a final note, keeping what we found today in mind, be cautious if you're ever comparing your sample or experimental results to a published statistical analysis from another study. Even if both studies are on the up and up, there may very well be more natural variability and uncertainty than you realize. <laughs>